Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Tasmania's Threatened Species Day webinar. Some of you joining us here today may know me for my many years of involvement in fundraising for the Tassie Devil. However, for those who don't know me, my name is Rebecca Cuthill and I'm the Director of Advancement. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you all join us today. We're really just blown away by the number of attendees who have chosen to Zoom in with us this afternoon. So whilst today we may be sitting in disparate places, on behalf of the University of Tasmania, and as a reflection of this institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, we wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Palawa people, the custodians upon the land upon which we meet and we would pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Just a few housekeeping notes before today's webinar gets underway. Your microphone, camera, chat function and raised hand function have all been disabled, so our speaker is not interrupted. But we really encourage you to ask some questions, and this can be done at any time during the talk by typing them into the Q&A function you see on the bottom of your screens. And a selection of these will be answered during the Q&A session towards the end of the presentation. And finally, just to let you know, this lecture is being recorded for later access on our YouTube channel, and the link will be shared. National Threatened Species Day commemorates the death of the last known thylacine or Tasmanian tiger in 1936. It's believed the tiger died from cold after being locked out of its sleeping quarters at Hobart Zoo. Neglect may have been responsible for the demise of the last individual devil um, tiger, but these species have already received its death sentence, despite being common in Tasmania before European settlement in 1803. Thylacines are believed to have been driven to extinction, predominantly by hunting, with habitat destruction and disease also likely to have played a role. Since 1936, sadly, other species have followed the Tassie tiger down the extinction path. National Threatened Species Day encourages us to reflect on this and to think how to protect our unique Australian fauna and flora into the future. Today, we focused on threatened species in Tasmania. The Save the Tasmanian Devil Appeal, managed by the University of Tasmania, is the most important fundraiser for the devil, delivering vital funds to support high calibre research and monitoring programs. The appeal's primary focus is to support research to better understand devil facial tumour disease and its impact on wild devil populations. To investigate strategies to protect these populations, and to develop potential treatments for the disease. It's now my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our speaker and real life devil worshipper, Dr. Ruth Pye, research veterinarian with the Tasmanian Devil Immunology Group at the Menzies Institute for Medical Research. Ruth first, first became interested in transmissible cancers while working for a street dog sterilization program in India. Ruth moved down to Hobart in 2013 to start a PhD with the Tasmanian Devil Immunology Group at Menzies, and where she was actually supported via a scholarship funded by the Save the Tasmanian Devil Appeal. Ruth continues to work tirelessly, my I say, with the group whose goal is to develop a protective vaccine against transmissible cancer, devil facial tumour disease, which, as we all know, has been decimating the Tasmanian Devil population. Today, she'll be talking about the role she plays in securing the future of this iconic animal. And following her formal present presentation, once again, I really do encourage you to put forward any questions you may have. For now, I hand you over for, to the very capable hands of Ruth. Thanks so much, Rebecca for the lovely introduction. Um, and thanks to everyone who's joined this presentation today. Um, for those of you looking at your screen, um, you'll notice these beautiful drawings that I'm actually lucky enough to have hanging in my house. And I asked the artist if I could use them for my presentation today. Um, so the devil, of course, because that's a threatened species that we're talking about today. And then the thylacine, which as Rebecca said, um, National Threatened Species Day commemorates the death of the last thylacine in captivity in 1936. Um, and I always think that any image of a thylacine 
is a really poignant reminder of what can happen when a species is listed as threatened. Um, so I wanted to um, just start off today by just briefly clarifying these terms, sort of threatened and endangered and so on. Um, so in the 1960s, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature set up its red list of threatened species. And over the decades, uh, experts in their field have been um, acquiring data on every species of animal and plant where possible. Um, and based on the analysis of this data, the species are put into one of a number of categories. So they go from least concern um, right up until the extinct category. And the term threatened um, is an umbrella term that applies to the species um, listed as vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. And in 2006, the um, Tasmanian devil was listed as endangered due to the threat of devil facial tumor disease. So I'm gonna be talking quite a lot about um, facial tumor disease in the next 20 or 30 minutes. Um, but I, first of all, just wanted to reflect on why this is important, you know, why, why does it matter that the, the devils are endangered and their numbers are continuing to decline? So of course, the devil is an iconic species, like it's the largest living carnivorous marsupial in the world. Um, it's found in the wild only in Tasmania and it holds a special place in the heart, not only of most Tasmanians, but also of people around the world. And so of course there would be this profound sense of loss if the devil becomes extinct. Um, but more importantly is the role that the devil plays in the Tasmanian environment. So devils are specialised scavengers and opportunistic predators. And as a specialised species, um, they play a critical role in maintaining the balance of the Tasmanian ecosystem and preserving the biodiversity. And so devil facial tumour disease is threatening not only the devil, but also Tassie's unique environment. Um, now, I imagine most, if not all of you, have at least seen um, photographs of um, devils with devil facial tumour. And even the photographs are really confronting because um, these, these cancers tend to be large, ulcerating masses, most often on the, the devil's faces or inside the mouth. And death usually results within six to 12 months of um, that tumour first appearing. And death is the consequence either of starvation, like depending on the size and location of the tumour, or it's due to metastases and subsequent organ failure. Um, and so devil facial tumour disease is a, a, a really awful cancer that's caused the suffering of thousands of devils and the continued decline of the species. Um, but at the same time, it's also a really fascinating cancer because it's one of these very rare cancers that are transmissible. Um, so the, with the transmissible cancers, it's the cancer cell alone that is transmitted from one individual to the next. So there's no involvement of a virus or a bacteria or any other pathogen that we typically associate with infection. It really is just the cancer cells alone. Um, so this means that the, the transmissible cancers defy basic rules of immunology, um, because strictly speaking, the immune system of an individual should recognise as foreign any cell or tissue that comes from a, a separate individual, and those cells should undergo immune-mediated rejection. And this, of course, is um, the biggest risk in human transplant medicine when um, the recipients um, uh, uh, risking uh, rejecting their donated organ or um, so the donated liver or kidney. Um, and one way the doctors have of overcoming this is putting the recipient on high doses of immunosuppressive drugs. Um, but the transmissible cancers are successful because um, primarily because they have these really powerful mechanisms of immune escape. So um, devil facial tumour disease was first observed in a devil in 1996 in the far northeast of the state. And prior to that, the only known transmissible cancer in existence was this sexually transmitted cancer in dogs. 
um, called canine transmissible venereal tumour. Um, so this cancer is present throughout the world in any area where there are free ranging undersexed dogs, and that includes um, parts of Northern Australia. Um, and this uh, TBT, as it's known for short, um, has been around for an estimated 8,000 years. And then in 1996, um, DFTD was first observed. And then in 2014, uh, we discovered a second transmissible cancer affecting the devils. So this one is referred to as devil facial tumour 2. Um, and grossly, it looks very similar to the original um, devil facial tumour or uh, DFT1. Um, but at the microscopic and molecular and genetic levels, it's um, completely different. Um, so it makes two transmissible cancers. And then at around the same time as um, we found DFT2, researchers were looking at a disease in clams, so an invertebrate species, and they realised that this disease was, in fact, a transmissible leukaemia. And um, they have since found another five of these transmissible leukemias in a variety of um, shellfish species. So the thought is that the, the leukemia cells are passed from one clam to the next in the ocean water as the clams um, filter hundreds of litres of water each day. Um, so at the moment, as far as we know, there are nine transmissible cancers in nature. Um, so we've known about DFTD since 1996. We've known that it is serious enough to have um, the devils listed as endangered since 2006. But the question that most people have, um, you know, is what is the current status of devils and DFTD? And um, last year, this really great modelling paper was published, which has answered just that. So Callum Cunningham was the primary, uh, the first author, and um, he's from University of Tasmania. And he and his co-authors um, collected a whole lot of data that had been acquired over the last 35 years, so going prior to um, DFTD. And this data came from um, um, spotlight surveys and the capture mark recapture devil trapping trips. And um, they modelled the data and were able to come up with some very robust um, estimates and predictions. So um, they estimated that the devil population was at its peak in 1996 at around 53,000 devils. And by 2020, um, this number had dropped to approximately 16,900 devils. So that was a fall of 68% of the population. Um, and now they've predicted that um, the devil population will continue to decline over the next 10 years, but that it will then plateau at around 11,900 devils. Um, the authors also um, estimated that DFTD was present in more than 90% of the devil's geographic range in 2020 and predicted that it would cover 100% of the range by 2022. Um, so this, of course, suggests that the devils will not go extinct. However, the authors made um, a couple of really salient points in their discussion. Um, the first being that they only included one, the one threat of the original um, devil facial tumour, DFT1, um, in their modelling. And, you know, currently DFT2 is only present in the southeast of the state, but um, it's quite likely that it will increase its geographic range. And we don't know what will happen to the devil population when both, um, or when and or if both DFT1 and DFT2 um, become prevalent. Um, and then the other point, of course, is this concept of functional extinction. So um, it's not unusual to have, you know, a number of wild animals of a, a threatened species, um, wild, wild individuals of a threatened species in the wild, but um, if they're not at an appropriate density, then they can't carry out their um, ecological role. And even at this current um, level of approximately 17,000 devils, um, there, have, there are areas where the devils are present but are functionally extinct. Um, 
in any case, this paper has given us um, a really good understanding of the um, situation of the devils and DFTD um, at the moment and a, a good idea of what we could expect in the near future. Um, so that was the first question, what is the current status? The second question a lot of people ask is, you know, what is being done to address the threatened status of the devils? And broadly speaking, um, whenever a, a species is threatened, there are one of two main processes that might reverse that situation. So um, the first is evolutionary rescue, which essentially um, is depending on mother nature to reverse um, the situation. And in the case where, you know, it's a, a disease that's causing the primary threat, um, that evolutionary rescue would look like um, the host developing some um, resistance or tolerance to the disease. Um, and at the same time, that disease becoming less virulent. So there it becomes a sort of a coexistence between the, um, the host and the pathogen. With genetic rescue, um, this involves uh, human intervention, um, typically in the form of captive breeding programs. And in cases where um, you know, populations have been decimated, um, individuals either from the captive breeding program or um, you know, from other populations of the same species that haven't been affected um, are introduced to these decimated populations. Um, with the idea of either maintaining or improving the genetic diversity of that um, population and also um, raising the, the population density to a point where um, that population is um, functional and is self-sustaining. Um, so as far as devils and evolutionary rescue go, um, unfortunately, at the moment, there's no convincing evidence that evolutionary rescue is occurring to um, an extent where it's having any great impact on the current trajectory of the disease. However, um, there have been some really um, uh, sort of exciting or um, um, areas that have come from the field that suggest, you know, that 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 there are um, is reason for hope as far as um, evolutionary rescue goes. So the first um, applies to this handful of devils that have had documented tumor regressions. And so that means that um, devils that have been wild devils, which have been trapped on one occasion with um, confirmed devil facial tumors, have been trapped um, then on subsequent occasions and those tumours have disappeared. So this is exciting because, um, you know, it's good evidence that the tumours can actually be recognised by the devil's immune system and that an immediated rejection um, can occur. Um, the second sort of glimmer of hope from the field comes out of the Save the Tassie Devil programs annual monitoring trips. So um, since, I think since 2002, um, the Devil program has been carrying out um, monitoring trips at various sites across Tasmania to see what effect um, devil facial tumour disease is having on those local populations. And in the majority of cases, so in seven out of the eight um, locations where DFTD is present, um, they found that the devil um, population or the devil density has either plateaued at a really low level or is continuing to decline. However, there is one site um, at Fentonbury, which is just a couple of hours west of Hobart, um, where the population density has been increasing over the last six years. So the mechanism for this is not known, um, but um, it's exciting nonetheless because it is um, unusual. And further monitoring and sample collection from these devils and analysis may um, at least tell us if that um, trend continues, but also potentially um, inform on what that mechanism might be. Um, now, as far as genetic rescue and the devils go, um, in 2006, when the devils were listed as endangered, um, a captive 
insurance population was set up and that was to preserve the genetic diversity um, that existed in the wild population. So um, that is carried on to this day. There are um, devils held in facilities both in Tasmania and on the mainland that all contribute to this breeding program. And it's under um, the advice of um, the Australasian Wildlife Genomics Group from University of Sydney. Um, now, in 2015, um, the Save the Devil program started a trial um, that they, they called a population augmentation trial. And this is essentially what I was talking about before, where individuals from the insurance population were before, where individuals from the insurance population were released into um, a couple of parts of Tasmania where the pop local population had been decimated by devil facial tumour. And so those sites are continuing to be monitored to see what effect um, this release has had on the uh, genetics of the local population and also the population density. Um, oh, and what I forgot to mention is that in 2012, sorry, the, um, the um, population, the insurance population was expanded to include a DFTD free wild population on Mariah Island. Um, now, when um, disease is um, the process that is um, primarily threatening a species, there is another um, course of action that can be taken. And that of course is vaccination. Um, now, this is hard enough in, to vaccinate a, a wild um, animal population when a vaccine already exists, but it certainly has happened. Like there are um, numerous examples of, for example, where wild African dogs have been vaccinated against rabies and distemper. Um, uh, Black-footed ferrets and um, prairie dogs in the US have been vaccinated against distemper and sylvatic plague. Um, the kakapo, um, which is a, a, a native um, New Zealand bird, has been um, vaccinated against erysipelas. Um, now, unfortunately, there currently is no um, protective vaccine available for devil facial tumour disease, um, but that's something that our um, Tassie Devil Immunology Research Group at Menzies has been um, trying to develop um, over the last, probably about the last 12 or so years. Um, now, once again, just broadly speaking, um, and I'm going to spend probably the rest of the, the talk just um, telling you about where we have come um, with our vaccine research. So um, when a, ca a cancer vaccine is under development, there are two broad approaches that could be taken. So one is using the whole um, tumor cell as the basis for the vaccine. And the idea of that is that any um, um, you know, target molecule or antigen that will flag, um, present itself as a flag to the immune system and um, trigger an immune response against the cancer will be present somewhere in that cell. The other approach is to identify those particular antigens and use just the antigens as the basis for the vaccine. So um, when our devil group um, under the um, guidance of Professor Greg Woods and um, um, started with this idea of developing a vaccine, um, it was using the whole, the whole tumour cell because the, the, the DFT cells do grow really well in culture. Um, and then they get manipulated to make them even more immunogenic or more visible to the immune system. Um, and then they're inactivated either by um, radiation or sonication, which is essentially pulverizing the cells. And then um, there's a few other um, steps to the process, but then that is essentially the vaccine and what um, is, is administered to the devil. And in um, uh, 2014, um, 2013, 2014, we had some really encouraging results from these um, candidate whole tumor cell vaccines um, in a small number of devils in captive trials. And those results coincided 
with um, the population augmentation trials that I mentioned earlier, where the Save the Devil program was releasing devils from the insurance population into the wild. And so prior to their release, um, these devils were immunised with these candidate whole tumor cell vaccines. And the good thing was that um, all the devils mounted um, a measurable immune response against devil facial tumour. But um, unfortunately, by 2017, it was apparent that that immune response was not protective against um, DFTD. So you can imagine how disappointing that was. And it meant going back to the drawing board. Um, but uh, a couple of things have happened either at that time or subsequently, which have really fuel injected our, um, our devil, our vaccine research. So um, the first was the arrival of Dr. Andy Fleece into our group. Um, so Andy is an American researcher and he did his PhD on um, hyena immunology. So he was already familiar with um, the immune system of a top order scavenger. Um, but just as important, um, he has a strong background in molecular biology and genetics. And so Andy has led us down this path of the antigen specific um, cancer vaccine. Um, so this approach is it's much more technically sophisticated and it's required an enormous amount of genetic sequencing and analysis. Um, and a number of really smart people, both in our group and in groups interstate and overseas, um, have managed to identify a number of mutations which are unique to the tumour cells um, and not present in the healthy devil genome. And so it's these mutations or these um, antigens which will form the basis of the vaccine. Um, the other um, event, I suppose, which has um, assisted greatly with our um, research is the COVID pandemic, which of course has had many adverse effects, um, but I guess there are always silver linings. And the, um, the acceleration of um, technologies and the advancements in um, disease diagnostics and so on have been um, really helpful. Um, the other thing the COVID pandemic has done, of course, is increased um, public awareness and public interest in um, vaccine development. And so if I say to you that um, our current candidate devil vaccine um, is using very similar technology to that used in um, the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca COVID vax, you might be familiar that, um, you know, they had this adenoviral vector or platform and the, the spike um, protein from the, the COVID vax, the gene for that is inserted into this um, vaccine vector. In our case, of course, it's the genes um, of these mutations um, found only in the DFT cells that have been inserted into that adenoviral vector. Um, so we are still some way off um, being able to test the candidate vaccine, this current candidate vaccine in live devils, um, but we anticipate um, we'll be able to start the trials um, sort of toward the um, mid to late next year. Um, but developing the vaccine is obviously only one of the challenges. Um, if, assuming, or even if um, we are successful, um, the next challenge will be delivering that vaccine into a significant number of wild devils. Um, and once again, Andy's come up with this idea of an oral bait vaccine, which means um, it would be able to um, distribute rather than having to, to trap and inject the devils, um, we'd be distributing these baits across the landscape um, and in that way getting much better coverage um, of um, devils. And this idea has come from... Um, the oral rabies um, bait program, where they were successful in eliminating um, rabies from large parts of Europe um, because rabies um, had a, a wild animal reservoir in the red fox. And so the, um, 
these baits with the, the rabies vaccine had been distributed across the, um, the landscape and um, has been really successful. Um, and the same strategy has been used um, in the US to um, vaccinate their wild animal reservoirs. So um, raccoons and mongoose um, and so on. Um, I just, yeah, was going to now finish um, by saying that you could probably imagine that amongst um, all the devil researchers out there, there is um, a lot of debate as to whether evolutionary rescue or genetic rescue um, will come to the rescue of the devils. Um, I guess in our group, we would like to think that if we are successful in developing a protective vaccine against DFTD, and able to deliver it to a significant number of wild devils, um, that that debate might become a little more academic because a successful vaccine um, will go a long way toward conserving the species. So that's what I'll leave you with, thank you. That was um, tremendous, Ruth. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, Watching it all just just makes me reflect. You and I've kind of been um, involved, you know, mean far more tangentially than you um, in the Tassie Devil. And it just amazes me where things have progressed in the last few years. It, it, it's actually quite quite amazing and quite inspiring, actually. So we've got a few questions coming in from from some of our um, group. The first one I'll just flick to because it's a really nice way. Um, to start the Q&A session is from um, Caitlin Manu, who said she just wanted to say thanks so much to you, Ruth. Um, she's been working in the zoo industry, but left a year ago. And she said the hardest part was saying goodbye to her gorgeous Tassie devils as well. Oh, and just reflecting on how much she's learned today. Um, and she continues to be inspired and be an advocate for the Tasmanian devils. And I suppose that's something quite true for many people who have um, worked with Tassie Devils or, or in my case, you know, helped to raise some funds for them. They do have something special about them, I think, as well. So perhaps, Ruth, I asked the question, what was it that drew you first to Devils? Oh, it was really by chance. As you mentioned, I think, in the introduction, um, I um, became interested in the what well, was the canine transmissible tumour when I was in India and we were um, collecting any samples of the um, the, the dog tumours mm. for um, a scientist, Liz Murchison, who runs the transmissible cancer group in um, Cambridge. But she's an, a Tasmanian, like she's this wonderful geneticist. And um, I did meet up with her a couple of times, you know, to hand over the samples. Mm. And um, she was telling me about the devil facial tumour and the devils. And um, she had a a close collaboration with Professor Greg Woods and um, Dr Alex Kreis, who were, as you say, things have come a long way because they were the original members of the Tassie Devil Immunology Group. Um, so, yeah, it was through this um, that I became more familiar, certainly with DFTD and then, um, yeah, with the devils as well. And, yeah, I can't thank her enough. Like, it's really <laughs> a, you know, a wonderful opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful, Ruth. So um, I think the other thing that's come a long way and, you, and you've touched on it in your talk is around the delivery of the of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'd be really interesting for people to understand and we'll get to a question that people have around the live bait. Can you describe what it was like when you were doing um, the first vaccines on the ground with those devils that were released up in the northwest and um, in the north of the state and how labour intensive it was? I think it'd yeah, be really interesting for people to understand kind of what that actually entailed. Yeah, sure. Um, so these devils, um, prior to their release, they were held in large free range enclosures and um, the devil program uh, were uh, trapped them on a couple of occasions through four health checks and um, we would vaccinate them the first um, lot of devils that were released into Narantapu. Um, were given a total of four vaccinations actually which was very labor intensive um, and then there were 33 devils released into stony head in the north and they were just given two like we realized that um, even though we got really good immune responses from the four vaccinations it wasn't a practical protocol mm -hmm. um, 
I must say that even though most of those devils at Narantipu weren't retrapped, um, we never did trap a vaccinated devil with um, DFTD. So, um, but you know, the numbers were too small to demonstrate whether or not that that mm. protocol mm. had been effective. Um, so, but anyway, as I said, were not practical. Um, and so then um, we reduced that to a, a, a two mm. sort of shot protocol for the stony head devils. Um, but even those small numbers, so you know, thirty three. Um, at Stony Head and 15 at Narantapu, it took a long time um, and, yeah, required uh, trapping them on each occasion, which mm. is never guaranteed, particularly when you've got a large area and you're trying to, um, yeah, um, trap uh, 70 to 80% of devils. Indeed. And then they were having to lie between the middle of your legs, Ruth, I remember, and you actually having to yeah. put needles in and inject yeah. them also. It's like it's um, the oral bait seems a, 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 a far, far less invasive as well. And one yes. of the questions yes. we've we've got here from, um, from Lisa is how do we make sure devils don't get um, too much of the vaccine if we're using baits? Oh, that's such a good question. And I guess the honest answer is we don't know if they're, is going to be too much. Um, I, we're basing a lot of this, um, I, or we're still yet to work out protocols, I suppose, of how much of, you know, this, like I say, viral vector with the, um, the DFT antigens, um, what will um, um, translate to one dose? Mm -hmm. And yes, what is a maximum dose and whether there would be adverse effects from too much vaccine so I guess there's there's a couple of answers um and you know we are learning a lot from the um rabies the oral rabies bait vaccination protocols um the other thing is um and I guess this refers to how we actually get um enough devils to take the vaccine and no other off-target species um but one uh, we had an honest student working on the oral bait platform last year and he tried out this oral bait dispenser which we um, um, had sent over from um, the US Department of Agriculture which is um, the department in charge of the rabies vaccination program over there and um, you know this dispenser has a timer on it and so this could be one way of um, minimizing the number of baits certainly that are taken at any one time um, there is also yeah and like I say there's a lot of discussion going on at the moment amongst us and collaborators is what might be possible to identify individual um, devils and maybe minimize their chances of taking up too much bait too quickly um, but I, I suppose the ideal situation would be is if um, the the is not a, a dose that is going to be too um, too much or going to be cause harm to um, any devils that you know get in excess. Of it. Yeah, thanks, Ruth. So I kind of think related to that really is a question we've got from Emma, who said, "Would an oral vaccine then mount an immune response in the young devils who are vaccinated?" Yes. Yeah, it yeah. should do. Yeah, any yeah. devil and and the naive the. The juvenile devils, I guess, the same with any species. Um, they've got such good immune systems and they tend to have the best responses to a vaccine. So, yep, if um, it would yeah, it would be the juveniles who um, are, are leaving their den, so at around just, yeah, just under one year of age, might be inquisitive enough to, um, yeah, get up to the bait dispenser or however we end up distributing it around the landscape. Um, but, yeah, certainly any devil should be protected. Assuming we get the vaccine up and going. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. So, so kind of continuing on the on the vaccine. Patricia's asking, are there any devil vaccines being developed using mRNA technology? Oh, and that's also a really good question um, because obviously these mRNA um, vaccines are um, the hot thing right now. Um, the thing though with um, RNA is that it's very um, sensitive it's very fragile and you know these are the vaccines that need to be um, stored at minus 80 degrees and so particularly if we're going for um, the oral bait uh, vaccine approach um, yet yeah, they just wouldn't handle being um, stored in a bait in the environment for any um, length of time. Yeah, terrific. Thanks. Thanks, Ruth. So probably a broader question, I think, now, less, less just around the vaccine. Anne's just asking, what do you think about introducing disease-naive devils into wild populations? Can this be successful in your opinion? 
So um, I'm assuming by disease naive, it's populations yeah. that have not, not been out there in the wild before from other yeah. places. Yeah, sure. And as essentially this is what um, the program has mm. done um, in the past. And... Yeah, it's it's a really tough one because presumably like every devil is susceptible to DFTD. And so then there's this ethical question of whether these devils um, that are released are inevitably going to get um, tumours. Um, but then you balance that with um, the fact that, you know, the devils will be carrying out this really critical role in the environment um and you know they may well be able to play a really um important role for a number of years mm. before they succumb to disease and the other thing you know i suppose it would be fabulous if there were more of these individual devils that i referred to previously yeah. where um you know they have shown um some resistance to the tumor and they have been able um to reject that tumor and i guess you never know at this stage like we are um, in conjunction with um, the Wildlife Genomics Group at University of Sydney. Um, our group is trying to see if there is any genetic component to um, the immune responses that we are uh, measuring or mm -hmm. that we are observing in um, wild devils. Um, but at this stage, yeah, we don't know if there is a, a, um, a significant genetic component or what that genetic component might be. Um, but the rewilding is going to continue, Ruth, in some level, that we will be putting dev vaccinated devils back into the population? Um, um, I know the program is still um, taking some devils from Mariah and releasing them um, mm -hmm. into um, particular areas of the state, but mm -hmm. um, we haven't been vaccinating those devils for years now, right. not since we've recognised that that candidate vaccine that we were using was not protective. Right, Okay. Okay, that's really good. Um, so we have another question from um, Emma, who's what is the likelihood that DFTD would mutate in response to the vaccines? Oh, and that's another really good question. Um, we have obviously have very clever people. Yeah, I reckon <laughs> testing me. <laughs> um, yes, and so um, actually this geneticist that I mentioned before, Liz Murchison, she's very interested in that question and um we would work like we sort of um like I said there are a lot of things that we need to um or processes processes that we need to have in place before we do roll out a vaccine in the environment and one is of course monitoring what happens to the devils the vaccinated devils in the wild and what happens to the tumor um and so I can't say that there's no chance that the vaccine will have no effect on the tumor but we will be monitoring that really closely with um the transmissible um, cancer group in Cambridge um, and yeah, no doubt some other researchers um, who are particularly interested in that question. Yep. And is Liz also looking, Ruth, at the um, why some devils are actually showing an immune response to DFTD and are fighting it off? Is that... Uh, that's not Liz's field particularly. No, she's... Um, um, I mean, she's very interested in it, but her um, main sort of questions is, yeah, with the um, evolution of the tumour. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's more so um, um, Carolyn Hogg and Kathy Bellov from mm -hmm. the Australian Wildlife Group. Um, right, so that, that question is being kind of addressed and looked at. Yeah, then. absolutely, yes. Yep. Yeah, because yes. yeah, it's such an interesting one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and gosh, and um, Rodrigo Hamidi and Mena Jones and mm -hmm. their US collaborators are also very interested in um, what genetic um, component there might be in mm -hmm. um, any sort of this evolutionary rescue or um, yeah, development of um, um, resistance or tolerance. To that. Terrific. Yeah, because we'd had a question about it and perhaps it's a um, another Threatened Species Day um, webinar topic as well that, that might be covered off. So I have Phil asking about um, whether um, DFTD is prevalent on the west coast of the state and what are the studies finding in this more isolated region? Right. So I did actually see there's a um, Wool North, which is on the far northwest tip of Tasmania um, is one of these um, annual monitoring sites that the um, say the Tassie Devil Program visits. And I saw um, Claire the other day, who's the biologist, one of the biologists who um, visits that site. Um, 
And she said that out of 100 and something devils that they trapped, because it is um, quite a dense population, they still haven't had any um, confirmed DFTD in that population. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, that far northwest corner is um, believed to be disease-free, um, but it, DFTD is present further down the coast, like Granville Harbour is another one of those um, annual monitoring sites where and mm -hmm. DFTD is present there. Mm -hmm. um, the southwest um, is obviously a very difficult place to monitor because it's so remote and access is really difficult. Um, the Devil Program had a trip into there a few years ago and they trapped a few devils and all of them were healthy. Um, and I think there are some cameras out in that area as well. And so far there's been no evidence of DFTD in the southwest. Um, but, yeah, um, yeah it, the population there is much more sparse. Thanks, Ruth. And um, we've had a question from Kristen, and perhaps we didn't quite cover it off or um, in your presentation, the vaccine that you're working on, mm -hmm. um, that's effective against both forms of devil facial tumour oh, disease. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, I didn't um, can, um, clarify that, but, yeah, that's mm. correct. Yep, yeah, we yeah. hope that it would protect against both. Yeah, terrific. Thanks very much. Um, we did have a question submitted earlier. It was more around um, uh, the high level of roadkill um, of the Tasmanian devil. And um, the uh, Liz, who submitted the question, was kind of interested in some of the collaborative research um, to reduce the number of devils. Now, I know this is not your particular area of research, but you've obviously got an interest because it's a, a massive concern for anybody, frankly, who, who lives in the state seeing um, roadkill and roadkill of Tasmanian devils when they're mm -hmm. um, endangered. So are you um, aware of any consideration being given to plans to address um, roadkill? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and that's so true because, you know, I mean, is Tasmania the roadkill capital of the world probably? Mm -hmm. and even though we almost take it for granted now and, you know, we think, well, the devils are, if they're not going to go extinct from DFTD, then they're fine. But um, roadkill is the next biggest killer of devils. Mm -hmm. well, vehicle strike is the next biggest killer of devils. And um, when a species is, um, you know, critically endangered, um, then it can just take, you know, one um, lesser threat to really finish them off. So roadkill is um, a really important issue for the devils. And um, yes, the devil program has been um, actively monitoring the number of devils that are killed each year on the roads. And they have employed um, these things called virtual fences um, in parts of the state and um, tried to assess whether that is beneficial in reducing the amount of um, vehicle strike, not only of devils, but of other species as well on these um, you know, hotspots or roads where there have been um, a lot of um, deaths. So um, they've had some trouble, uh, I think with some vandalism and so on of mm. some of these virtual mm. fencing, and it is very expensive. Um, but yes, it's certainly on um, very much so on the radar of the program as a significant threat. Yeah, thanks so much, Ruth. And I think um, kind of as we draw to a close, I'd just like to bring you back to the first slide you shared with us all, which was talking about other transmissible cancers um, as well. Does your work translate into the work that's being done for, for other um, animals? Um, well, like I said, uh, as far as other species with transmissible cancers, the shellfish, no. <laughs> And I just say that because I don't know anything about um, clams. Um, I do know that, um, you know, their immune system is completely different. Like they don't have this major histocompatibility complex molecule, which is probably underpins a lot of either, um, you know, the reason why um, devil facial tumour disease is so successful and also why we see these occasional um, cases of tumour rejection. Um, and with the dogs, um, even though it's a transmissible cancer, it's got a very um, different impact on the individual animal. So um, the, the canine tumour tends not to be um, malignant and mm -hmm. even though it causes these nasty lesions and the dogs can get very sick and you get these secondary infections and so on, um, it tends not to cause the death of the dog in the same way that um, DFTD almost inevitably causes death of the um, devil. And if, in the early days when they sort of realised that TVT was a novelty and was a transmissible cancer and there was a lot of research going on and they did actually try to develop a cancer against um the canine transmissible venereal tumour. Um, but um, 
it was successful on tumours that had been induced experimentally but not, um, I don't even know actually if it was tried in um, dogs that had naturally occurring tumours. I guess because of those reasons, like it's, um, dogs are an abundant species and, you know, it's easily prevented by desexing the dog and keeping it confined and um, it doesn't cause death and, yeah, it hasn't definitely hasn't created the splash, I suppose, that um, DFTD has. What is interesting, um, maybe for some other researchers, is um, uh, I guess the parallels with human transplant medicine. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're trying to do the opposite. Like they, um, the transplant um, medics are trying to prevent those donated organs from being rejected by the recipient mm -hmm. and we're trying to trigger the opposite we want the tumors to be rejected by um, the devils and so we've had some really interesting conversations um, with um, researchers and doctors in um, human transplant medicine um, look thanks so much Ruth it's been absolutely fascinating today and I really reflect you know 1996 and then um, when the first devil facial tumour disease was identified up at um, Wukalina and um, where we're kind of at at the moment. So on behalf of everybody who's been listening today, I wanted to say thank you. Um, we've had a comment from Linda who said, thank you for giving us a sense of hope on Threatened Species Day. So I'm sure everybody's joining me, um, albeit silently, in um, thanking our speaker, Dr Ruth Pye. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. And if what you've heard today is important to you, I'd like to um, ask that you please consider donating to the Save the Tasmanian Devil Appeal. Um, we're very proud to support research that happens at the University of Tasmania and more broadly elsewhere. And we're certainly very proud that we've supported Ruth um, during her journey um, working on devil facial tumour disease as well. This afternoon's talk will be available on video and the link will be shared in our next edition of our Devil E newsletter, Devil's Advocate, which is going to be landing in your inbox in a fortnight as well. Thank you very much, Dr Ruth Pye, and thank you everyone for taking part in today's Threatened Species webinar.